And a friend asked me to read um, Art and Mass Culture. <clears throat> I'm already a little tired, so to see how this goes. Uh, Art and Mass Culture by Horkheimer. Horkheimer, yes. Uh, Max Horkheimer. It's up here. At times in history, art was intimately associated with other avenues of social life. The plastic arts, in particular, were devoted to the production of objects for daily use, secular as well as religious. In the modern period, however, sculpture and painting were disassociated from town and building, and the creation of these arts reduced to a size suitable to any interior during the same historic process. Aesthetic feeling acquired independent status separate from fear, awe, exuberance, prestige, and comfort. It became, quote-unquote, pure. The purely aesthetic feeling is the reaction of the private atomic subject. It is the judgment of an individual who abstracts from prevailing social standards. The definition of the beautiful as an object of disinterested pleasure has its roots in this relation. The subject expressed himself in the aesthetic judgment without consulting social values and ends. In his aesthetic behavior, man, so to speak, divested himself of his functions as a member of society and reacted as the isolated individual he had become. Individuality, the true factor in artistic creation and judgment, consists not in idiosyncrasies and crochets, but in the power of withstanding the plastic surgery of the prevailing economic system, which carves all men to one pattern. Human beings are free to recognize themselves in works of art insofar as they have not succumbed to the general leveling. The individual's experience embodied in a work of art has no less validity than the organized experience society brings to bear for the control of nature. Although its criterion lies in itself alone, art is knowledge no less than science is. Kant examines the justification of this claim, how he inquires can be aesthetic judgment in which subjective feelings are made known, became a collective or common judgment. Science rejects feelings as evidence. How then can one explain the community of feeling invoked by art works? Current feelings among the masses, to be sure, are easy to, exp to explain. They have always been the effect of social mechanisms. But what is that hidden faculty in every individual to which art appeals? What is that unmistakable feeling on which it relies time and again, despite all contradicting experiences? Kant attempts to answer this question by introducing the notion of a census communis aestheticus, to which individual assimilates his aesthetic judgment. This notion must be carefully distinguished from common sense in its usual meaning. Its principles are those of a kind of thinking that is unprejudiced, consecutive, and enlarged, that is, inclusive of the viewpoints of others. In other words, Kant thinks that every man's aesthetic judgment is suffused with the humanity he has in himself. Despite the deadly competition in business culture, men are in accord concerned in the possibility they envision. Great art, says Peter, must have something of the human soul in it. And Guayu declares that art occupies itself with the possible, erecting a new world above the familiar world, a new society which we really live, in which we really live. An element of resistance is inherent in the most aloof art. Resistance to the restraints imposed by society now and then floating forth in political revolution has been steadily fermenting in the private sphere. The middle-class family, though it has frequently been an agency of obsolescent social patterns, has made the individual aware of other potentialities than his labor or vacation opened for him. As a child, and later as a lover, he saw reality not in the hard light of its practical biddings, 
but in a distant perspective which lessened the force of its commandments. This realm of freedom, which originated outside the workshop, was adulterated with the dregs of all past cultures, yet it was man's private preserve in the sense that he could there transcend the fusion society imposed upon him, the function society imposed upon him by way of its division of labor. Seen at such a distance, the opportunances of reality fuse into images that are foreign to the conventional system of ideas into aesthetic experience and production. To be sure, the experiences of the subject as an individual are not absolutely different from his normal experiences as a member of society. Yet, works of art, objective products of the mind detached from the context of the practical world, harbor principles through which the world that bore them appears alien and false. Not only Shakespeare's wrath and lawn, oh, melancholy, not only Shakespeare's wrath and melancholy, but the detached humanism of Goethe's poetry as well, and even Proust's devoted absorption of the ephemeral features. This, uh, I'm not sure, that might be a mondanite. Awakened memories of a freedom that makes prevailing standards appear narrow-minded and barbarous. Art, since it becomes autonomous, has preserved the utopia that evaporated from religion. The private realm, however, to which art is related, has been steadily menaced. Society tends to liquidate it. Ever since Calvinism sanctified man's calling in this world, poverty, contrary to the accepted notion, has in practice been attained to be washed away only by a toil. The same process that frees each man from slavery and served him and returned him to himself also broke him in two parts, the private and the social, and the burdened. I guess it says burdened. The private with a mortgage. Life outside the office and shop was appointed to refresh a man's strength for office and shop. It was thus a mere appendage, a kind of tale to the comet of labor, measured like labor by time in termed, quote unquote, free time. Free time calls for its own curtailment for it has no independent value. If it goes beyond recreation of expended energies, it is regarded as wasteful, unless it is used utilized to train men for work. The children of the earlier 19th century who were taken from workshop to dormitory and from dormitory to workshop and fed while at work lived exclusively for their calling like Japanese factory girls of today. The labor contract in which this condition was grounded proved itself a mere formality. Later in the 19th century, the chains become, became looser but self-interest subordinated private life to business even more effectively than before, until the structural unemployment of the 20th century shook the whole order. The permanently unemployed cannot improve a career that is closed in advance. The contrast between the social and private is blurred when mere waiting becomes a calling and when work is nothing but waiting for work. For a few decades, broad strata in industrial countries were able to have some measure of private life, though within strict limits. In the 20th century, the population is surrounded by a large trust and bureaucracies. The earlier division of man's existence between his occupation and family, always valid only with reservations so far as the majority was concerned, is gradually melting away. The family served to transmit social demands to the individual, thus assuming responsibility not only for his natural birth, but for his social birth as well. It was a kind of second womb, in whose warmth the individual gathered the strength necessary to stand alone outside it. Actually, it fulfilled this function adequately 
only among the well-to-do. Among the lower strata, the process was generally frustrated. The child was left only too early to his own devices. His aptitudes were prematurely hardened, and the shock he suffered brought in its wake stunted mental growth, pent-up rage, and all that went with it. Behind the quote-unquote natural behavior of ordinary folk, so frequently glorified by intellectuals, there lurks fear, convulsion, and agony. The juvenile sex crimes as well as national outbursts of our time are indices of the same process. Evil does not stem from nature, but from the violence committed by society against human nature striving to develop. In the last stages of industrial society, even well-to-do parents educate their children not so much as their heirs as for a coming adjustment to mass culture. They have experienced the insecurities of fortune and draw the consequences. Among the lower strata, the protective authority of the parents, which was always menace, has worn away entirely until finally the Balila has slipped into its, into its place. Totalitarian governments are themselves taking in hand the preparation of the individual for his role as a member of the masses. They pretend that the conditions of urbanized life clamor for it. The problem so brutally solved by fascism has existed in modern society for the last hundred years. A straight line runs from the children's group of the Camorra to the cellar clubs of New York, except that the Camorra still had an educational value. Now let's see what the note says. On the subject of cellar clubs, see the adolescent court and crime prevention. Okay. Um, uh, da, da, da. Okay. Today, in all strata, the child is intimately familiar with economic life. He expects of the future not a kingdom, but a living, calculated in dollars and cents, from some profession which he considers promising. He is as tough and shrewd as an adult. The modern makeup of society sees to it that the utopian dreams of childhood are cut short in earliest youth, that the much-praised adjustment replaces the defamed Oedipus complex. If it is true that family life has at all times reflected the baseness of public life, the tyranny, the lies, the stupidity of the existing reality, it is also true that it has produced the forces to resist these. The experiences and images which gave inner direction to the life of every individual could not be acquired outside. They flash forth when the child hung on to his mother's smile, shut off in front of his father, or rebel against him. When he felt someone shared his experiences in brief, they were fostered by that cozy and snug warmth, which was indispensable to the development of the human being. The gradual dissolution of the family, the transformation of personal life into leisure and of leisure into routines supervised to the last detail into the pleasure of the ballpark and the movie, the bestseller and the radio has brought about the disappearance of the inner life. Long before culture was replaced by these manipulative pleasures, it has already assumed an escapist character. Men had fled into a private conceptual world and rearranged their thoughts when the time was ripe for rearranging reality. The inner life and the ideal had become conservative factors. But with the loss of his ability to take this kind of refuge, an ability that thrives neither in slums nor in modern settlements, man has lost his power to conceive a world different from that in which he lives. Okay, I'm going to take a quick pause to get some water. Should have done this before, I apologize. I'll be right back.
Okie dokie. Uh, I hope this is working still. This other world was that of art. Today it survives only in those works which uncompromisingly express the gulf between the monadic individual and his barbarous surrounding. Works like Joyce's and paintings like Picasso's Guernica. The grief and horror such works convey are not identical with the feeling of those who, for rational reasons, are turning away from reality or rising against it. The conscience behind them is rather one cut off from society as it is, and forced into queer, discordant form. These inhospitable works of art, by remaining loyal to the individual as against the infamy of existence, does retain the true content of previous great works of art and are more closely related to Raphael's Madonnas and Mozart's operas than anything that harps on the same harmonies today, at a time when the happy countenance has assumed the mask of frenzy and only the mel melancholy faces of the frenzy remain in a sign of hope. Today, art is no longer commutative. In Guayo's theory, the aesthetic quality arises from the fact that a man recognizes the feeling expressed by a work of art as his own. The life analogous to our own, however, in the portrayal of which our own life becomes visible, is no longer the conscious and active life of his 19th century middle class. Today, persons merely appear to be persons, both elites and masses obey a mechanism that leaves them only one single reaction in any given situation. Those elements of their nature which have not yet been canalized have no possibility of understandable expression. Under the surface, under the surface of their organized civic life, of their optimism and enthusiasm, men are apprehensive and bewildered and lead a miserable, almost prehistoric existence. The last works of art are symbols of this, cutting through the veneer of rationality that covers all human relationships. They destroy all superficial unanimity and conflict, which are all, in truth, clouded and chaotic. And it is only in such sagas as those of Godsworthy or Jules Remains, in white papers and in popular biographies, that they attain an artificial coherence. The last substantial works of art, however, abandon the idea that real community exists. They are the monuments of a solitary and despairing life that finds no bridge to any other or even to its own consciousness. Yet they are monuments, not mere symptoms. The despair is also revealed outside the field of pure arts and so-called entertainment and the world of cultural goods. But this can only be inferred from without through the means of psychological or sociological theory. The work of art is only adequate objectification of the individual's deserted state and despair. Dewey says that art is the most universal and freest form of communication. But the gulf between art and communication is perforce wide in a world in which accepted language only intensifies the confusion in which the dictators speak the gigantic lies the more deeply they appeal to the heart of the masses art breaks through barriers which are impermeable in ordinary association this is by also by dewey also by dewey <clears throat> These barriers consist precisely in the accepted form of thought, in the show of an unreserved adjustments, in the language of propaganda and marketable literature. Europe has reached a point where all the highly developed means of communication serve constantly to strengthen the barriers that divide human beings. In this radio and cinema, in no way yield the palm to airplane and gun. Men, as they are today, understand uh, are men as they are today understand each other. If they were to cease to understand either themselves or others, if the forms of their communication were to become suspect to them and the natural unnatural, then at least the terrifying dynamic will come to a standstill. To the extent that it 
that the last works of art still communicate, they denounce the prevailing forms of communication as instruments of destruction and harmony as a delusion of decay. The present world denounced through it is by its last works of art may change its course. The present world denounced though it is by its last work of art may change its course. The omnipo the omnipo the omnipotence of techniques, the increasing independence of production from its location, the transformation of the family, the socialization of existence, all these tendencies of modern society may enable man to create the condition for eradicating the misery these processes have brought over the earth. Today, however, the substance of the individual remains locked up in himself. His intellectual op acts are no longer intrinsically connected with his human essence. They take whatever course the situation may dictate. Popular judgment, whether true or false, is directed from above, like other social functions. No matter how expertly public opinion may be inquired into, no matter how elaborate the statistical or psychological soundings, what they reach is always a mechanism, never the human essence. What comes to the fore when men most candidly reveal their inner selves is precisely the predatory, evil, cunning being whom the demagogue knows so well how to handle. A pre-established harmony prevails between his outward purpose and their crumbled inner lives. Everybody knows himself to be wicked and treacherous, and those who confirm this, Freud, Pareto, and others, are quickly forgiven. Yet, every new work of art makes the masses draw back in horror. Unlike the Fuhrers, it does not appeal to their psychology, nor like psychoanalysis, does it contain a promise to guide this psychology toward adjustment. In giving downtrodden humans a shocking awareness of their own despair, the work of art professes a freedom which makes them foam at the mouth. The generations that allow Hitler to become Great takes its adequate pleasure in the convulsions in which the animated cartoon imposes upon its helpless characters. Not in Picasso, who offers no recreation and cannot be enjoyed anyhow. Misanthropic, spiteful creatures who secretly know themselves as such like to be taken for the pure, childish souls who applaud with innocent approval when Donald Duck gets a, gets a cuffing. There are times when faith in the future of mankind can be kept alive only through absolute resistance of the prevailing responses of men, such time is a present. At the end of his book on aesthetic problems, Mortimer Adler defined the external marks of the great work of art, gross popularity at any one time or over a period of time, and the ability to have the most varied levels of taste. Consistently with this, Adler praises Walt Disney as the great master because he reaches a perfection in his field that surpasses our best critical capacity to analyze and at the time please children and simple folk. Adler has tried, like few other critics, for a view of art independent of time, but his unhistorical method makes him fall prey to time all the more. While undertaking to raise art above, while undertaking to raise art above history and keep it pure, he betrays it to the contemptible trash of the day. Elements of culture isolated and deserved from the historical process may appear as similar as drops of water, yet they are different as heaven and hell. For a long time now, Raphael's Blue Horizon have been quite properly a part of Disney's landscapes, in which Amoretti frolic more and more recently than ever did at the feet of the Sistine Madonna. The sunbeams almost back to have the name of a soap or a toothpaste emblazoned on them. They have no meaning except as a background for such advertising. Disney and his audiences, as well as Adler, unswervingly stand for the purity of the Blue Horizon but perfect loyalty to principles isolated from the concrete situation makes them turn into their very opposites and finally results 
in perfect relativism. Adler's book is devoted to the film which he loyally measures according to Aristotle's aesthetic principles, thereby professing his faith in the suprahistoric validity of, philosoph of philosophy. The essence of art, he says, is, in is imitation that combines the greatest similarity of form with the greatest difference of content. This Aristotelian doctrine has become a cliché, the opposite of which the greatest similarity of content with the greatest difference of form will do as well. Both belong to those axioms which are so calculated that they can easily be adjusted to the conventional doctrine in each field. The content of such principles, whether favored by metaphysicians or empiricists, will not hurt anybody's feelings. If, for instance, science is defined as the aggregate of all their Bible statements, one may be certain that every scientist's approval. One may be certain of every scientist's approval. But even an empty generality such as this discloses its double dealing potency as soon as it is related to the real world, which verifies the judgment of the powerful and gives the lie to the powerless. A dogmatic definition of the beautiful protects philosophy no better from capitulating to the powers that be than a concept of art derived from the uncritical applause of the masses, to which it bows only too readily. I wonder if I can maybe... I might need to pause it here. Yeah, do like a part one and then a part two, because my voice is going... Um, I already did a lot of talking today, so chose the wrong time to start recording this. Uh, yeah, I am so sorry, but I will finish it for sure as soon as possible. Um, but we'll just do this part one. So part one ends in um, it was three o three at the end of three o three. No, three o four. Here we go, 305. So I'm just gonna do a little highlight here. Oop. So I can remember, and then we'll take off. As soon as I can, I'll, I'll, I'll read you the rest. But yeah, right now I'm, 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 I'm done. It's getting painful. All right, part one. <clears throat> 